time. Everything happens in time. Day and night. Laughter. Pain. Life. And death. Time moves at a precise and measurable pace. between the unknown and known. It's in that place where redemption awaits. impossible for us to fully comprehend what it means that the full authority, the full power of heaven would come down to this earth wrapped in flesh fully God, fully man for you and for me what a gift thank you Jesus Come on. and really all we have to offer is our humble worship and so right now we're linked up with all of our locations we're going to sing together and we're going to exalt King Jesus, would you join us? Come on, let's sing. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him, and He is exalted, forever exalted, and I, I will praise
Can we pray together? Jesus, we worship and adore you for all that you are. And Jesus, we thank you that when we couldn't make our way back to the Father, you made your way to us. You put on our flesh. You understand every hurt and every challenge that we face. And today, this Christmas, Jesus, we invite you to speak. We're listening. We ask you to awaken us to your love and your grace and your peace today. And Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. And everybody said together, amen, amen. Hey, one more time. Can we adore Christ the Lord together? Yeah. Well, Merry Christmas and welcome to Traders Point. Welcome to everyone joining us online. and. A very special welcome to all of the kiddos here joining us today. We're so glad that you were able to be in here with us to celebrate the birth of our Savior. My name is Chad, and I get the privilege to be one of the pastors around here. It's already been an incredible gathering, and yet we're just getting started. If this is your very first time here with us, welcome. We're honored that you take a bit of your Christmas to spend it here with us. In fact, come on, Traders Point Key, help me welcome in our new guest today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're a church that's all about Jesus, and we love to remove unnecessary barriers to keep people from him. It's why we gather all over the city each and every weekend to create time to learn from Jesus, to respond back to him. And if you'd like to learn how you can more fully engage with us, I wanna invite you to download the Traders Point app today. Uh, there you can take notes on Sundays, you can watch past messages, look ahead to future events, loads of resources and so much more. Just visit the website on the screen to download it today. Hey, before uh, Pastor Aaron makes his way to the stage, we need to celebrate what God has been doing in and through us uh, with our Christmas Impact, Impact Project this year. Uh, throughout all of our campuses, we've been collecting toys over the past several weeks to share them with our local outreach partner, Shepherd Community Center. Uh, we set a new goal this year of collecting 10,000 items and Traders Point. Uh, you not only met the goal, but you exceeded it by nearly 2,000 items. Come on, it's incredible. Way to go, way to go. Go ahead and say Merry Christmas to the people sitting around you. And as you have a seat, uh, take a look at the video on the screen celebrating what we've gotten to be a part of. Christmas store is one of our largest events throughout the whole year and it's really something that there's pieces of it happening kind of all throughout the year. We are inviting 
all of the families connected to Shepherd to come and shop for Christmas gifts for their kids. And it's an incredible time of year here at Shepherd. We love it and we love a chance to interact with our neighbors and bless them in this way. And they get a chance to come in and shop for gifts. Right now, this just has been an overall blessing. It's, it's really touching my heart in different ways. Like, it's filling my heart up with joy. There's a lot of different folks that uh, will come and be a part of it, They'll come and volunteer. They'll wrap gifts. They'll walk people through the store. It takes a lot of people to make uh, this event possible. A uh, big shout out to Traders Point Christian Church. Because of the generosity of Traders Point, we have the ability to come down and bring 11,800 gifts to be a part of Shepherd's Christmas Store. We love our partnership with Shepherd Community Center. They are such a gift to the city of Indianapolis, specifically on the east side. Over 500 of our families are coming through and over 1,500 kids will get gifts through this store this year. This Christmas store is all about helping parents feel dignity, getting to come into the store, getting to pick out the toys for their kids. So each family that's coming is paying $5. And that's not about raising revenue for Shepherd. It's about helping someone realize they have something to give back. We'll actually take that money and donate it to a missionary in Ecuador this year. It's all about saying to a neighbor, there's value in who you are. You have something to give back. And this is one way that we get to do that. Hey, come on, let's give it up. I wanna thank you guys for showing up big every year for the Christmas service project. And uh, I just wanna say uh, to everyone across all of our locations and everyone joining us online, Merry Christmas. Man, it's good to be with you guys. And uh, I love these services every year for all kinds of reasons. Um, but one of them I know is that uh, there are people that are gathered uh, today at our Christmas services, and, and maybe uh, you don't normally uh, come to church, or, or maybe it's been a while since you've been, and man, I'm so glad that you're here. And I have begun to kind of anticipate a uh, conversation that I have almost on a yearly basis. Uh, it's usually after Christmas, several months, just sometimes during the year, maybe I'll bump into somebody at the grocery store uh, or maybe the lobby or uh, my favorite is in this back hallway here when we're doing baptisms. And I'll just ask somebody, hey man, tell me your story. And uh, it's not uncommon for somebody to say, well, I came to a Christmas service for the first time. You know, somebody invited me or I just kind of felt like maybe I should go to church since it was Christmas or somebody kind of twisted my arm and gave me an ultimatum. And so I went and uh, I had a good experience and so I just came back and I came back again and again and again, and I eventually met Jesus. And man, I just never get tired of that conversation. I have that conversation every year to the point now, oh, as it comes to Christmas services, I'm just anticipating that there's more people listening to this right now that I'm gonna have that conversation with later in 2024. And so I just want you to know that I'm praying for you. I'm so glad that you're here. And I believe that if you're really listening and your heart is in the right place, that you just might have an encounter with God beginning today. And so I just want to take this opportunity to invite you back. On January the 7th, first weekend of the new year, we're kicking off a brand new message series that I'm really looking forward to. And the reason why is that back on Easter, I just take the opportunity to uh, run a, a, do a poll. Uh, and the primary reason why I poll our congregation on Easter is because uh, that's the day, as well as Christmas, you all decide just to show up at the same time. And so I'm gonna take advantage of that. And so I just took a poll and I just asked you like, hey, what sermon series would be the most helpful for you in your spiritual journey, like wherever you are? The number one answer was, uh, if you could do a sermon series on discovering God's purpose for my life. And I just thought, man, that's a great topic. Like we've all been in that situation where we're like wondering, should I go this way or that way? Should I start this relationship or not? Should I take that job? Should I make that move? What, God, what is your purpose or will for my life? And so on January the 7th, we're gonna start a new series called Reimaged, uh, Discovering God's Purpose for My Life. And so I just wanna encourage you to come back. It's gonna be highly, highly practical and encouraging. And I think that uh, it'll be uh, really useful for you. Well, um, you know, one of the things I've been told uh, that is a good rule of communication is uh, to know your audience. Have you ever heard that? 
That's pretty good counsel, especially like on a day like today, because I just know there's a whole lot more people here than maybe uh, is normal. And so maybe this is the first time that we've had a chance to, to meet. And so what I want to do is I just want to have a little bit of fun at the top of the message here. And I just kind of want to know who I'm talking to. And so we're going to do a little Christmas tradition uh, vote is what I'm calling it. I'm going to throw up uh, two options over very hotly debated issues, right? These are the things that divide us. And what I want to do is I just want to throw up an option, and I just want you, whatever a Christmas tradition preference is yours, I just want you to cheer for that. Now, here's the deal. The loudest cheering wins. Now, let's raise the stakes, all right? Uh, the loudest cheering wins the debate for good. Like, we're not going to argue about it any... I know, that's wishful thinking, right? But, but it's kind of fun to think about, so we'll just raise the stakes on that. Maybe that'll cause you to cheer a little bit louder. So we're going to go with an easy one uh, right off the top. How many of you would be fake Christmas tree people? Any fake Christmas tree people? There you are. Highly practical. You know the value of a dollar. One-time purchase. Easy storage. No watering. Done deal, right? Now, how many of you have the true spirit of Christmas? Clark Griswold, we're going out with an ax. We're gonna cut down our own real tree. Yeah. There we go, there we go. We got people standing. They got sap dripping off their fingers even now, right? All right, I don't know, man. I think the real tree people want it. That's pretty impressive. That's pretty impressive. How many of you would be uh, elf on a shelf? You're like, hey, man, we'll play that game. We got little kids at home. Elf on a shelf, people. Here we go. <laughs> It's been hilarious. Every single service, there's a delay in the cheer. And I, my theory is, you're like, can we clap for that in church? Like, is that, is that bad? All right, is that Elf on the Shelf, all right. How many of you are like, you know what? Elf on the Shelf is like the Christmas version of Chucky, right? That's just a little weird. Yeah, there we go. I gotta tell you guys, man, we did Elf on the Shelf every year when our kids were young. My youngest is 12. I am so thankful that we are done with that because I couldn't sleep at night. That thing freaks me out. Freaks me out. All right, how many of you, uh, you would be, uh, when it comes to Christmas wrapping, you are the professionally wrapped. It's got to be pristine. Joanna Gaines looks like she lives in our house. Come on, where are you at? There we go. There we go. How many of you are like, no, nope, do it yourself. All right, I don't. There we go. Yeah, yeah. We know it looks like a kindergartner wrapped it blindfolded. We don't care. Yeah. There we go. All right, uh, how many of you, uh, when it comes to Christmas decorations, you don't want to see a single Christmas decoration until Thanksgiving is done? Where are you at? Where are you at? There we go. This is, uh, this is restoring my hope because I was beginning to wonder, man, where those people were. How many of you, though, are you like, no, we want to celebrate Jesus as much as we can as soon as Halloween is over? Labor Day, we're pulling out the boxes. All right. Yeah, there we go. All right. How many of you, when it comes to uh, Christmas movies, you are all about Elf, right? It's not Christmas till so you see Elf. There we go. Yeah, we just had this uh, on the other night. It's a good movie. How many of you are like, no, it's not only is Die Hard a Christmas movie, it is the best Christmas movie of all time. It is not Christmas until Bruce Willis throws Hans Gruber off a tower. That's how strongly we feel about it. All right. How many of you, one last one, you're like, you know what, We just give us some Mariah Carey, all I want for Christmas is you, baby. There we go, there we go. Hey, man. hey, you don't need to be ashamed of that. You just blare that loud and proud, right? How many of you be like, literally anything else? Literally anything else. There we go, there we go. Oh man, uh, if there's anything that that shows us, we are a church divided. Just, man, just pray, to pray that God would unify us. Now, actually, I, I don't, that was a lot of fun. I, I don't think that any of that's a surprise to us, is it? I mean, I think all of us know that we kind of live in, a, you know, a pretty divided society and time. That if there's anybody that has any sort of opinion about anything, you just know somebody else is going to have the exact opposite impassioned opinion. And we're, we see just things just from different angles. In fact, uh, if we don't uh, divide, are divided over it, we'll just find stuff to argue about, even just for fun. Now, some of that can be good. You know, I think that there's a lot of strength in the idea of having unity in diversity, that we're not always necessarily seeing things the same way. We can learn from each other. But there's a difference between having some diversity around the way that we see things and then us being divided in 
anger and anxiety. And, and I would say that, um, you know, we live in a pretty divided time to where uh, what one group of people sees as good, another group of people same, sees the same thing and says that it's bad. And maybe you're even beginning to just sort of like wonder, you know, is, is, is peace even possible in our world? Things just seem so dark and divided and people are anxious and their mental health is, is struggling and, and they're angry and is it even possible? And one of the things that I wanna encourage you with today is that when you look at the original Christmas story in Luke 2, which we're gonna do here in just a moment, you'll see that things weren't so different then as they are today. The world then, 2,000 years ago, was just as dark, you might even argue darker, than what it is today. That they were just as divided, if not more so then, than what they are today. And it was in the midst of that darkness and division that God sent his son, Emmanuel, to be among us. You know, when it comes to the Christmas story, you, you, in order to truly understand it, in order for it to impact you, you gotta understand two primary elements to it. One is the message of Christmas, uh, that Emmanuel, God came to us, that Jesus came into the world. He didn't wait for us to come to him, he came to us. That's the message of Christmas. The second thing, though, is just as important, we just often overlook it, is the messengers of Christmas. In other words, what God said, who God said it through. And one of the things that you see is that they were just as divided, they, they had differences of opinion, they couldn't have been more different from one another. They had a lot of things to be fearful of. Check it out with me in Luke chapter two, beginning in verse eight. It says, in the same region, there were shepherds. All right, hold on to that. We have a tendency to take them for granted. We're just kinda like, oh yeah, yeah, they were there. But we're gonna circle back to that in a minute and show how strange this fact that Luke includes them is. There were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night and an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were, here's the statement, filled with great fear. And I'm just guessing they're not the only ones. I'm just guessing a fair number of people here today listening to this would agree. Uh, you know what, there's a lot right now to be fearful of in the world. Verse 10, the angel said to them, fear not. Some of you know that that's the most common command given in the scriptures, those two words, fear not. Something tells me that God knew that we not only needed it then, we need that reassuring today. Now, and he says, fear not, Here, here's why. Behold, I bring you good news, notice the progression, of great joy that will be for all the people, that's unexpected. Verse 11, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior who is Christ the Lord. I'm gonna circle back to that statement, good news, of great joy for all the people. When was the last time that you heard good news that brought great joy to everyone? That everyone cheered at the same news? In fact, uh, you know, you can turn on the TV to a news channel and one news channel will report some activity that happened in the world and they'll take it from the angle that this is good news and then you switch over to another news channel and they report the exact same story through the lens that it's bad news. We're so divided. And yet here we see this announcement in Luke 2 it says, hey, this is good news, great joy for all people. What this is, what the Christmas story is in Luke 2 is an announcement. It's an announcement of God's answer to the hurt and hopelessness, the division and anger and fear that we all feel. And this announcement would have been one that the Jewish people in particular would have been anticipating for a long time. How many of you like to wait? Yeah, I don't like to wait. Man, I go to a restaurant, 20 minute wait, we're out of here, we're going to the next one. I can't wait, I can't do that. You know how long the Jewish people have been waiting for the Messiah? 400 years. They've been waiting 400 years for the Messiah to come. The word Messiah just simply means deliverer, somebody who would set them free. So this announcement is huge. Therefore, they would have felt that it was for them and for them alone. After all, who else has been waiting for 400 years? And I can't blame them for feeling that way. 
Uh, however, they, they had heard that there was this Messiah that was come to deliver them, but it says that this is good news of great joy for all people. It hadn't occurred to them that this would be for everyone, even the people that voted the exact opposite of the Christmas tradition vote, even the people that think that Die Hard is a movie. It's for them too. And did you notice that Luke makes the effort here to tell us that some of the very first people to hear the news of this announcement were shepherds? And maybe that doesn't seem too unusual to you, but actually it should be. That should be unusual. Here, here's why. Uh, did you know there's four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all tell us about the birth of Jesus. Luke is the only one to mention the shepherds. I mean, they've been in every Christmas pageant that I think I've ever seen. I always had this image that shepherds um, were like uh, older and wiser and, you know, like, I don't know, like retired Navy SEAL types, you know, they're like, like Gandalf from Lord of the Rings, you know, they've got this long beard and a staff and, and there might've been a few of those, but in reality, most of the shepherds in the first century were homeless boys. And this detail that Luke includes the shepherds and says that, that the announcement was made to them first, you got to understand that that would have been unusual at best, and then it risked discrediting the whole account at worst. Now, it wasn't always that way. During the time of the patriarchs, shepherding was a noble occupation. The earliest mention of them is in Genesis chapter 4. Yet when the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt, they encountered a lifestyle very different from them. Because Here's why. The Israelites were primarily shepherds. The Egyptians were primarily farmers. And the Egyptians looked down on shepherds. I, I think some of this may have had to do with the fact that uh, they considered sheep and goats worthless. They were hard on the crops. They weren't good for food or sacrifice. So as a result, the Egyptian art forms and historical records portray shepherds in a negative light. The first murder in human history uh, ensued when a farmer's resentment of a shepherd caused him to take his life. When Cain, the farmer, took the life of his brother Abel, the shepherd in Genesis 4. Genesis 46, later on in life, when uh, Joseph gets reunited with his brothers, I don't know if any of you recall this story, he kind of gathers them up, they're in Egypt now, and he says, hey guys, you know, just a little tip, the Egyptians despise shepherds, which is what they did for a living, and he goes, so hey, when Pharaoh asks you your occupation, save yourself some grief, tell him you're a farmer. And as a result of this, over the course of 400 years, the Egyptians prejudiced the Israelites' attitude towards shepherding. Shepherding had not only lost its widespread appeal, it forfeited its social acceptability. Many of them became uh, victims of a cruel stereotype. The religious leaders took shots at shepherds in an effort to discredit them, and rabbis banned pasturing sheep and goats in Israel except on desert plains. The Mishnah, Judaism's written record of oral law, also reflects this prejudice, um, referring to shepherds in belittling terms. One passage describes them as incompetent. Another one said that no one should ever feel obligated to rescue a shepherd who has fallen into a pit. That's just low. What is that? That's first century cancel culture. And the reason why I'm mentioning all of that is that Luke includes them as the first group of people to hear the announcement that this good news of great joy was for them too. It was into this social context of class prejudice that a handful of marginalized, unpretentious shepherds were handpicked by God to be the first ones to know and to announce Jesus' birth. Now here's, here's the question you gotta ask, why? Why? I mean, this is huge news. The birth of Jesus split time into two. Now you would think that God would pick a group of people that had a bigger social platform to tell the news to first. Somebody a little bit more prominent, maybe a king, somebody who had more social acceptability. Why in the world would God tell a group of shepherds news of this announcement first? And I don't know, I think the same reason why God chose a teenage girl who was unmarried named Mary to give birth to Jesus. Same reason. I think the same reason why God would pick a, a middle-class carpenter named Joseph. The same reason why God would have Jesus born as a helpless baby in Bethlehem. So you gotta understand the message of Christmas and the messengers of Christmas to begin to see how God sees you and me. You see, by including the shepherds, here's what God is saying. To anyone who has ever felt excluded, judged, or written off, to anybody who has ever felt discredited, dismissed, or despised, 
to anybody who's ever messed up, blown it, or failed. To anybody who's ever felt like they're just not measuring up or the pressure of life is beginning to crush them, the news of this Messiah, this deliverer is for you too. The hope of a new beginning is for you too. And this would just be a truth that Jesus would clarify over and over and over again in his ministry. In fact, one of my favorite passages is Mark chapter two, verse 17, where Jesus just, he just has to keep re-clarifying why he came on this rescue mission. And he says it so clearly here in verse 17. He says this, I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. In other words, he came for those who don't, think that they're okay, but for those who know they're not. Would you not agree that there is a big difference between the words think and know? Here's what I mean. I think I can still dunk a basketball at 47 years old, but I know I've never been able to. (laughs) I think it would be really cool to have six pack abs I know those donuts are gonna be really good, right? That's the difference. That's the difference between those two. So, So here's the thing. Many of us are gambling on our eternal future between those two words. I think I'm okay. No, you need to know it. I think I'm good with God. No, Jesus says, hey, I've actually come for those who don't think they're okay. I've come for those who know they are not. But I, but I think that we, we don't like that because there's something within all of us, me included, that just wants to minimize our need. It's pride. Honestly, it's fear. Because he, here's what uh, uh, admitting that you have a need is, is that you got to get vulnerable. And that actually means people can hurt you. And maybe for some of you, you, you got vulnerable. Like you opened up, you confessed something. You, you said, hey, hey here's, here's the reality of me. And somebody used it against you. And you said, never again. And you closed yourself off to not only people, but you closed yourself off to God. And you've said, you know what? I'll do this on my own. I think I'll just live a, a good life. I'll, I'll try to be you know, kind to other people. And I think I'll be okay with God. And when all this kind of washes out in the end, because after all, doesn't God grade on a curve? And so I'm not as good as some, but I'm not as bad as most. And so let me just kind of stay in the middle of the pack. And I think everything will be okay. And it sounds like a good theory, but then a guy named Paul just totally ruins it for us. <laughs> Romans chapter three, he says, verse 10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. Whoa. <laughs> Turn to your neighbor and say, I think he's talking about you. <laughs> he's talking about me. He's talking about all. No, listen to that. No one righteous, not even one. Think about that for a minute. Not even the best person you know. Not even your grandma, not Mother Teresa, not that person who's like so generous and kind and gracious. He says there is no one who lives their life in such a way that they can carry all this and be justified by their own actions. Nobody. Then he goes on. He's got more good news for us. There is no one who understands. Think about the smartest person you know. Not even them. There is no one who seeks God. Not even your favorite worship team. No one who seeks God. All have turned away. That's bad news, but it's actually news you've got to embrace before the good news can begin to be good. And he goes on in verse 20 and he says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. In other words, anything good that you can do. In fact, there's another passage that says all of our righteous acts, you take them all up from birth to death, it's just filthy rags in the eyes of God. Nobody can be declared righteous by living a good life. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. So here's what the law is. The law is not a magnifying glass where God's kind of zooming in to see if you've lived a good life. The law is a mirror that shows you that you can't live up to God's righteous standards. And that's when you can have incredible relief because you can drop the baggage and you can simply receive what Jesus died to give you. And you can lay down all of that effort because here's the thing. The reason why we're divided right now as people and as a society, the reason why we are so anxious, the reason why we are so angry is you dig down deep enough, you'll find fear because shame and guilt is simply crushing us. 
And you can go on kind of carrying the weight of your sin or you can let Jesus carry it for you. You can go on wandering through this life or you, you can let Jesus walk you through it. There, there are only two options of response to what I just told you. You can either receive it or reject it. Those are the only two options. There is not a third there's not a third option that says, hey, that's good information to know. I'll tuck that in my back pocket, maybe pull that out later. That's actually rejection. Because every time you kick the can down the road, every time you kind of push off that decision, here's what the Bible says, is that your heart gets harder and harder and harder and harder to the point that it's no longer responsive. Hard hearts don't beat. The good news just becomes white noise to you. But every time you respond to the prompting of the spirit, your heart becomes soft like flesh. And you become more and more responsive to God. And so I want to urge you to be responsive today, to not walk out of here rejecting it, but to receive it. And Jesus wants to actually be invited. Just as 2,000 years ago, he was born into the darkness of this world. Jesus wants to enter into your, the darkness right now of this world and guide you through it and provide a light. And things are really dark right now. I don't know why, but I popped wide awake at 5 a.m. this morning and I jumped up and I went and ran four miles. I don't know why. <laughs> I came back in and my wife was making coffee and she's like, what were you doing? I was like, I, I ran four miles. And she's like, why? You've got to preach like 40 million times today. I'm like, I really don't know, but I know it was foggy and dark. That's what I know. I, I figured that out on the run. I had one of those little headlamps on. I literally could not see two feet in front of me. And as I was, I don't know, maybe this is why God woke me up at 5 a.m. this morning to do it, because as I was running, I was like, man, this feels a lot like life. Gosh, I'm just like running, I'm just trucking through, and it's so foggy, and I don't know what 2024 is gonna hold for any one of us, and I don't know what's gonna happen on the other side of the world tomorrow, and things just feel so fearful and, and scary. And in that moment, I just kind of gotta stop, and I just gotta throw my arms open, and I just go, God, you know, this has gotta be on you, because I can't carry it. You are the light to light our path. You are the one that wants to come and guide us through these, uh, through these dark times. And there is a word for that. The word for that is shepherd. And isn't it interesting that after learning about all the ways that the shepherds were looked down upon and despised in the first century, the number one analogy, the number one word that Jesus is often referred to through the scriptures is shepherd. We can just go through the scriptures. Hebrews 13, 20, he's the great shepherd. John 10, 11, I'm the good shepherd. 1 Peter 5, 4, he's the chief shepherd. David pours out his heart in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I think the reason why we're so divided, angry, and anxious is we don't have a shepherd. We're just wandering. We're bumping into each other, yelling at each other because we're scared to death. And the message of Christmas is that he came for you. He came to be your shepherd and to shepherd you. He came to lift the weight of condemnation that you've been carrying and it is crushing you. He came to take on your sin so that you could put on his righteousness. You are that valuable to him. And what's keeping you from responding to him is you don't think he sees you and you don't think you have any value to him, but you do. And that's why we make such a big deal at Christmas because Christmas is God's announcement of how much value you have to him. When I was in junior high, I uh, collected uh, primarily basketball cards because I just uh, loved basketball. And, and so uh, I uh, have a few cards kind of left over from those days. A couple of these are mine. A couple of these are on loan. This is actually, I don't know if you can see this, if the camera can kind of zoom in on this. This is a Shaquille O'Neal rookie card. You know, that's kind of cool. Um, this one right here, though, um, this is not mine. Somebody loaned this uh, to me. This is a, a Kobe Bryant rookie card. It's a high amount of trust that... <laughs> Merry Christmas to me, actually. Just, uh, that's, that's actually pretty cool. Uh, um, this one right here, though, this, this is uh, what I'm about to show you. This is like the holy grail of like basketball cards. I wanted this card so bad when I was growing up, I could never get my hands on it. Uh, this is on loan to us. This is a um, Michael Jordan rookie card, all right? Now, what you need, some of you, this, this doesn't mean anything to you. You need to understand just how incredibly valuable this is. I practically had to sign my life away to get this. Um, this card, at most ever, it sold for over $700,000 at auction. So super, super valuable. Oh, <laughs> just kidding. All right, so I'm just kidding. This is the fake. All right, so those of you, breathe, breathe. We need a defibrillator over here. All right. Yeah, it's a fake. Some of you were on to me from the beginning. You're like, yeah, there's no way. There's no way that's real. 
Now, here's the thing. This actually makes my point, is that when you look at, uh, 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 if you've ever seen like a real authentic Michael Jordan rookie card and a fake, the fronts look, you know, pretty similar. It's the back that kind of gives it away. Now, here's the deal. Uh, actually, the real thing, like I said, will go for over $700,000. It's most ever, I think it's ever gone for. I don't know what this is worth. Just a few. In fact, the, the person that owned this, that loaned it to me, I said, hey, can I drop it? And they said, you can burn it for all I care. It's not worth much, right? So... <laughs> Merry Christmas to me as well. I'm gonna take it. Now, here's the deal. The difference between the real and the fake is what somebody is willing to pay for it. They're both cardboard and ink. The value is what somebody is willing to pay. Now, I want you to hear me really, really closely. The message of Christmas is that God saw you as valuable. And he says, what I'll pay for you is I'll send the life of my only son. In Luke chapter two, verse 11, it says this, and it gets real personal. It could have said, uh, for unto them. It could have said, for uh, unto that group over there. It actually says this, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior who is Christ the Lord. Unto you, unto you. That he was born so that you might be reconciled to God. And and John says that Jesus came into the world at a dark time and he came as the light and that light shone among men. And so what we're gonna do today as we close out our Christmas services is we're gonna do a candle lighting service. And this is my favorite part of our Christmas services. And and here's why, is that um, we're gonna take our candles and we're just gonna begin to light them and you're gonna watch this spread across the room. And the way that the light of the candle spreads is the same way the the light of the gospel spreads. You wanna know how we become unified? You wanna know how we achieve peace within the world? It's not by yelling at people that we disagree with. It's by allowing the light of Jesus Christ into our life that fundamentally changes us, and then it gets passed on to another and another and another and another. That's how it spreads, and it begins with the church. And so I wanna encourage you to take your candles, light them, then stand to your feet, And then we're going to sing some Christmas carols together.
your candles. John says that Jesus is the light of the world, and because of that, he is worthy to be praised. And I love how the psalmist says it, that God sits upon, he is enthroned upon the praises of his people. And so that's what we're going to do as we wrap up our Christmas services together, is we're just going to lift up our voices, we're going to raise them towards God, who is worthy of it all. Let's sing together.
response to Jesus who made it possible for you and for me to begin again. And if today you made that decision to begin a life-saving, life-changing relationship with Jesus, we'd love to celebrate that with you. We'll have some pastors down front in just a moment. We'd love to talk with you and to pray with you. Let this be the Christmas that you take your next step with Jesus. Hey, one quick note for all of us before you take off. Next Sunday is December 31st, and we will be online only for all of our normal gatherings at 8, 9.30, and 11.15. Uh, the live stream will be available at traderspoint.tv, Facebook, and YouTube. So gather up with people in your living room, and we'll see you online only next week. And remember, on January 7th, we'll be back in person as we launch our brand new series called Reimaged. Guys, it was so great to worship with you today. Have a great Christmas. We'll see you soon.